I'm Jonathan Mosen. This is Mosen at Large, the show that's got the blind community talking. Today, Russia's invasion of Ukraine from a blindness perspective. Memories of the old bulletin board systems. Songs you love and songs you hate. And a listener who's counting his blessings. Mosen at Large Podcast. Hello, welcome, thank you for listening this week. This is not the episode I was expecting to present and which I promoted just a few days ago on the Mosin Media List and the Mosin at Large website. Way back in episode two of this podcast, we discussed what psychologists call flashbulb moments. They are moments that have such an impact on us as a society that we distinctly remember where we were and what we were doing. We also tend to remember the dates. They are dates like the 3rd of September 1939, the 7th of December 1941, the 22nd of November 1963, and of course the 11th of September 2001. The 24th of February 2022 is now one such date, as we witnessed the largest unprovoked attack on a democratic sovereign nation since the Second World War. When I opened the previous episode, episode 166, I made the comment that every so often, I take a look and marvel at the many countries where Mosin at Large is heard. And one of those countries is Ukraine, although I feel sure that most people will have far more important things to do than to listen to this week's show. Because, as the former head of MI6, Sir Alex Younger, so poignantly told the BBC, the Ukrainian people are being punished simply for the crime of existing. But just in case... I want to send unwavering solidarity and support to our listeners there and indeed to all those who are facing and fighting a despicable attack instigated by a dangerous authoritarian bullying dictator and gangster. A man who wants to turn back the clock to an autocratic empire that must not be permitted to return. After weeks of a charade whose final outcome was inevitable, a liberal democracy has been attacked. This matters because we've already seen what happens when we reluctantly let it go. He is emboldened, and you can be sure that others who hate democracy are watching the ferocity or otherwise of responses to this outrage. It matters because freedom is often hard won and can be so easily lost. One of the challenges I think the human race faces today is that we have so much access to so much information that we can become desensitized to what we're being told. So I want to talk about the invasion of Ukraine in a way that many of us can identify with. Just a few short days ago, citizens were waking up to the usual sounds of a city awakening and another routine day. Kids thinking childish things and heading off to kindergarten or school. Young couples, perhaps wishing their finances weren't quite so tight, but thinking about the future, maybe thinking that they could treat themselves to a meal out at one of the many cafes and restaurants. Ordinary people with ordinary hopes and ordinary dreams and ordinary challenges on an ordinary day. And suddenly, many of those people are refugees. They've lost it all. Those remaining behind fear for their lives and seek to defend their country. Families are being torn apart as some stay behind to fight the aggressors while younger or older, more vulnerable people try to find safety. But increasingly, there's no safety to be found. Mosin at Large looks at all kinds of issues from a blindness perspective. So to open the show today, we're going to discuss Russian's illegal invasion of Ukraine from a blindness perspective. And joining me from Germany is Andrei Parikanin. Andrei has Ukrainian roots. He grew up in the Soviet Union in Russia. He moved back to Ukraine in 2008. And he has friends and family in harm's way. Andrei, I really appreciate you being here at such a difficult time. I know that this is a difficult conversation to have. Could I just ask you to introduce yourself to our Mosin at Large community? Well, thanks for having me. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, everyone. Yeah, my name is Andre. I'm now in Germany, in Mannheim, in the southwest uh, of Germany. I'm a web developer. Now I'm full-time employed. Uh, actually, it's not my education. Uh, per education, I'm uh, a linguist translator. 
So dealing with languages, but I've always dreamed about IT and IT careers, so to say. And that actually brought me to Germany because I found a work, a very good job here. And that's why, that's why I'm here. You know, I was reading just how much Ukraine has contributed to technology. And you look at things like the founding of WhatsApp, Grammarly, which is still not accessible. The list actually goes on and on in terms of IT professionals who started life in Ukraine. It's really remarkable, the contribution that Ukraine has made. Can I just ask for context in terms of looking back at the Soviet occupation before, how old are you? I'm in my 40s. You're in your 40s. So you have some memory of what Ukraine was like under Soviet control? Uh, yes and no. I had been living in Russia for quite a long time. It's even tougher, you know. So I know what Russia is, I know what Ukraine is, and now I know what, I know what Germany is. I mean, cult cult culture, cultural uh, context, so culture-wise technology-wise and so on and so forth, people-wise. Yeah, so my answer is yes and no. It must be hard to describe that, that oppression, that lack of freedom, all the things that people listening to this podcast in general will be taking for granted that were deprived of people in that whole Soviet sphere. It influences mentality, I would say. All the former Soviet people or people from ex-USSR are are impacted by this this yeah way of thinking by the this ideological pressure imposing of you know that communist ideology and so on and so forth so yeah that's very challenging and yet they had that taste of free markets of democracy before putin took control back and it's all gone that must be incredibly frustrating for those left there Exactly, exactly. The 90s, I mean, now uh, in Russia, for example, now it's very, very in vogue to to actually curse the 90s. Like 90s, the heaviest, the cursed time and so on and so forth. But now it, it was not like that. I mean, I, I assume it was like like that for, for many people, but not for all. And first and foremost, it's the time of freedom in Russia. The 90s, the 1990s, I mean, when everything opened, you know, the uh, Iron Curtain f just disappeared. We learned about different things about American culture, European culture, different products, different technologies, because before it was like non-existent or almost non-existent, the high technology. And the last time we had a Cold War type situation like this, a conflict situation like this, the main ways that those of us on either side of the Iron Curtain kept in touch with each other was through shortwave radio. And of course, the Russians did a pretty good job of jamming that. But things are so different now, aren't they? But yes, but still everyone used to listen to, so to say, enemy radio. You know? It's a Soviet expression, enemy radio. Yeah, but everyone everyone used to listen to that. There were some Russian language uh, programs, some Russian language broadcasters. Uh, w w for example, there was one very, very famous guy who broadcast from London in the UK. And he did uh, programs about rock, Beatles, Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, so forth, so on and so forth. Music unknown. Or, or virtually unknown in the Soviet Union. So that did exist. It, so it's again a yes, a yes and no. Officially, that didn't exist. But unofficially, it did exist, even then. So you said you'd spent some time in Russia. How much time yeah. did you spend growing up in Ukraine itself? I didn't grow up in Ukraine. I have Ukrainian roots. Right. So I actually moved to Ukraine in 2008. And... For me, it was like like moving home, you know. It's 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 a very it's a very soothing feeling, and it's a very very very. I mean, I mean, it's a it's a really great feeling when you feel home, when you feel on your land, 
that's something I really cannot express enough. When I think of what it means to be a New Zealander, there are certain cultural things, the way that we behave, certain songs, customs, that sort of thing. What is being Ukrainian to you? It's being proud. It's being proud of my country, of my people. It's love. I love my country. I love my people. Despite of some... Of, of course, we all have drawbacks and particularities, so to say. But still, I mean, it's mine. You know that before I've never... I've never known what nostalgia is. For me, it was like a nonsensical word. I mean, how can you miss something? How can you miss a, I don't know, a country or a, or a land or a, or a city? No, you can miss like, I don't know, your parents or your relatives or some people, some individual people. But how can you miss a place and miss a, pe uh, miss, miss a people in general? And I understood that only in Ukraine. You know, that's that's a very, very uh, tough thing, but very pleasant thing, I would say. Growing up then in Russia, what kind of access to blindness education and blindness services did you have? I was lucky. I was growing up in Moscow, in the capital. So in this sense, uh, there used to be, now I heard it's wor it worsened, but it used to be a good a good school for the blind at least in many aspects the only thing i really regret that i don't have a real a proper uh, o&m uh, training so i virtually i i walk very very bad uh, on my own with a white cane it's a shame i try to correct that even now when i'm adult but it's Like, like it is, unfortunately. But otherwise, other than that, uh, I was lucky. I had good teachers. Yeah, Braille with an uppercase B since my, I don't know, five years or so. My mother started teach teaching me Braille, although she actually does know it. But you know that tables like with uh, printed letters and Braille letters where uh, a, a mom can actually uh, teach her child braille so yeah that in that uh, particular thing uh, i was like i was lucky yeah what did you expect that you might do for a career when the soviet edifice was still a thing before perestroika and, and glasnost and all of those things that changed everything what were you hoping to do i actually Still something related to related to techniques, technology, not probably as outlined, not probably as exact as I would say now, like IT. Of course, I have no, had no idea about IT in those times, but still something to do either with uh, technology or with languages. Because I was, f I mean, my passion was, I was fascinated by how people are different, why Some people talk like this and some other people talk like that. How they are, I always like ask my mother how uh, uh, this or that person looks like. I mean, what's the face and the form of the nose and the hair and so on and so forth. I was very fascinated by the nationalities, ethnicities, ethnicities folk music and so on and so forth. Particularities, cuisine. So for me, either I'm, I imagine either a, a career of a maybe an ambassador or a translator or something to deal with languages. And later I uh, discovered technology and later I thought that, no, probably it would be something related to technology. And I guess when you were coming of age, that was the time when Gorbachev was doing all of his reforms and things were changing very quickly. But yeah. prior to that, when you look at people like me in traditional Western countries and particularly Americans – Did people tend to envy them or despise them? That depends. That depends whether people had any knowledge. If they have any knowledge, then that would be envy. Definitely. Our Americans, they have everything. 
they have genes chewing gums it, it was just so it i mean whoever listens to will understand genes uh, and chewing gums yeah and um the if you if you just uh, watch tv and you know nothing about those people of course you despise them that's you have no choice unfortunately and when you moved to Ukraine in 2008 to get back to your roots, as it were, that was a time when Ukraine was really a thriving democracy, wasn't it? You know, there had been democratic elections. They had been conducted yeah. successfully. So things were humming when you moved there. Yes, yes. It was It was under uh, President Yushchenko when, I don't know, with, I don't know how much you know about Ukrainian history and Ukrainian presidents and so on and so forth. So, yeah, it was a, a good time. It was a demo democratic time, so to say. Yes, and obviously things deteriorated fairly quickly uh, a few years later and before... Yeah, 2010, yeah. yeah, 2010, Yanukovych was elected and that was a... I would, before that, I would say it was a nightmare, but now, you know, now the war is raging. So it was... Quite a bad time, but not a nightmare, I would say. Mm. I mean, for the country, of course. I can only imagine that it must be incredibly distressing to be away from friends and loved ones at a time like this. How were you doing personally as you watch this go down from a distance? It's extremely tough, extremely stressing. I call my friends every day, of course, maybe several times a day. And we are getting some, just, uh, we need to, to come, to calm us a bit. I mean, to go for a walk, to get some, some soothing, I don't know, maybe some tea, some soothing music, something like that, because otherwise it's just, you, you just go mad because you scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll the news and scroll the news feeds and Twitter. I prefer Twitter. My wife prefers Facebook, for example, but you scroll either of those either Twitter or Facebook, and you just go mad. Because, you know, today I heard that Cherkasy, my, my city, my city is Cherkasy, it's 120 kilometers to the south from Kiev, from the capital. And today I heard that there was an, an air raid alarm in Cherkasy. You know, that's really tough. It's really tough to, to speak now. Array, an air raid alarm in my in my calm in my peaceful city, that's something unimaginable. Something something so unacceptable, so wrong. I cannot express it anymore. These are places that we hear in the news, but these are places that you have lived, and these are people that you know, and you can imagine normal life in those places, and within just a few hours. It was totally upended. It must be a horrible thing to have to deal with. Yes. Well, although we were prepared, thank you to uh, to America, to the U U.S., to President Joe Biden, to everyone who supported us, because he actually warned us. I mean, personally, he said that the in intelligence, the U.S. intelligence knew about the war that would, would come first time or first two times that actually that information actually made Putin uh, stop it, I mean, or prevented it. And the third time when he said, well, 24th of February, it would be, it would be an attack. And we woke up in the morning and my wife said she, she took her phone, just opened it, said the war, the war started, the war has begun. That was really, really tough. Do you think that people expected it or did they have this feeling that in the end there'd be a lot of brinksmanship, there'd be a lot of saber rattling, but he wouldn't go all the way in the way that he has? Uh, I guess both. We hoped, of course, that it would be more of a saber rat rattling, but in the end, Putin is a mad a madman. As a, uh, I guess it's it was a Dutch uh, prime minister who said that he's totally. I mean, he Putin is totally mad. 
And of course, we knew that it ca- it could happen. That's why the planes were in the air at five o'clock at five a.m. when they were actually be- began. You talked about how regularly you're getting in touch with people who you know. Is that still relatively easy to do at this point to stay in touch with those people? It's uh, more difficult, of course, because the connections are bad. The internet connection is not very stable, especially now in the bombing when when bombing occurs, because now like almost all the big cities in Ukraine are being uh, being uh, bom- bombarded with actually with missiles and bombs and all the various devastating things. So yeah, it's of course it's worse. And there'll be a mixture, I imagine, of people who are choosing to stay behind, tough it out, fight if they can, and those who are trying to flee. And so in that latter case, it's obviously very difficult to keep in touch with people. And there's a significant refugee crisis building. Yes, actually, there are many, many, uh, many types of people, so to say. There are even those who I have no such... um, People in my, so to say, bubble, you know, informa- informational bubble. But today I heard from another Ukrainian that uh, they have those people who actually kind of applaud what, what, uh, what is, what is not, not the war itself, but, you know, there, there were, Russia was in vogue at some time in Ukraine. You know, there were many Russian programs on TV and so on and so forth, of movies. I mean, like, most Ukrainians are able to understand la- Russian language. A, a vast, I, I would say a, a vast majority. So even even if they don't speak it, they do understand it, because the languages are in the same family, you know, the Eastern Slavic family, or a group of the languages. Yeah, and... Um, there are still some people who claim that it would be good it would be good to unite with Russia and maybe to even to uh revive the uh Soviet Union as i said that impacted impacted the mentality and yeah there are people who fight and fortunately there are many of them and there are people who flee of course and that's that's understandable yes yes Obviously, you've had that, shall we say, skirmish, those series of skirmishes going on in the eastern provinces for quite some time now. And then in 2014, the West kind of looked the other way while Putin annexed the Crimea. So it's almost as if there's been an emboldening that has happened over the last few years as people sort of just gave him a little bit and hope that that would make him go away. And we know from history that never works. Of course. Many Ukrainians say, like, look, Europe, look, the U.S. The war is going there for eight years. Yeah, now it's just raging like a a large war with missiles and bombings and so on and so forth. But it, it's actually going for uh, eight years nonstop. President Zelensky has been an exceptional communicator during this whole crisis and i have to say his speech which he gave directly to the russian people in russian which i heard translated was one of the most Mm. moving things i have ever heard in my life the government's now arming citizens with machine guns will many of them know how to use those has compulsory military training been something that ukrainians have had in recent years yes yes and also ukrainians are kind of passionate even that there are jokes about like arms ukrainians are very passionate about arms i would say many are hunters not not really really many but quite quite a lot of people are hunters quite a lot of people used to live in in lonely villages where i mean you have really wolves and bear and bears and uh various like animals like that like you know wild wild animals and you have to you have to know how to how to shoot sometimes because otherwise i mean you'll be eaten so it's not like we're not a military country per se we 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 don't like war we hate the war but 
many people know how to how to hold the arm actually his leadership really has been quite something uh, just before we got into recording this he was out there in the streets of kiev making it clear that he hadn't gone anywhere that the government was still there that the government was determined to tough it out and ah, to fight uh, that's because there was a hoax today you know the the, the third that war as claimed to be the the third world world war or a start of it is also informational war like in the social networks on the web and so on and so forth because yeah we had a cyber attack before each of those uh supposed attacks like that president biden prevent, prevented you know that that what I was, I was talking about before so that and today the host was like president zelensky fleed with his family from Kiev somewhere in Europe or I don't know to hide and he said no I'm here I'm staying he's actually braver than I personally thought thought of him and that's pleasing me it's often the case that these really tough situations can bring out the best in some people and it really seems that he is emerging as a truly great leader in a situation like this Yeah although we are we are called we are call, call ourselves like 25% that means that we voted against him in 2019 Actually what I I must say he was elected in a totally democratic and honest way that I cannot I cannot negate in any way that's true and everyone everyone recognized that So he was elected quite great in 2019 but we was we were like against him because we were very pleased and satisfied by what uh, by what uh, president poroshenko did before and president zelensky his not he was not like a figure that we would like to see in the as a, as a president of ukraine so to say Right. I mean some people viewed him as a bit of a lightweight didn't they because he he is a comedian by, exactly. by profession He was not like he was not a professional. I mean, at least he was not a professional back then in 2019. One of his motto was like I'm still learning. But people like me I say wait, how can you learn if you are in the president on the and chair of the president? A pilot cannot learn while he's in the in the plane full of passengers, you know. And he would say uh hello, he's our captain uh, our captain speaking. I'm still learning, so please Sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. You know, a, a, a country is a, such a plane full of like with 40 million million of passengers. It's kind of a bit too late to learn, you know, that kind of bit too late. So, uh yeah, that's why we we didn't take him seriously, so to say. Do you think this situation would have been any different if Zelensky had not been elected? I don't know. I, I just today or these days I start started respect respecting the uh, respecting him as a leader as a president. So I don't want to blame him. I don't want to say those things like if you were not a president the war there there there, there was not a war. That uh, that's a very a very tough I mean I don't want to accuse him like that. I mean in the end illegal aggression is illegal aggression right exactly yeah. yeah i hope so yeah probably probably namely president poroshenko probably he would make better make it better probably we would have more support from the eu and us and in other countries because he has and had and has a great authority in there for some reason but i know for some reason he's a very uh a very great also great communicator as you said about Zelensky but uh Poroshenko also has contacts in there in EU and US and so on and so forth so probably maybe we will we would have avoided that but i don't know but with putin you never know 
you never know. And to be fair, Ukraine has been strung along for a very long time. NATO has been saying, in good time, Ukraine will be admitted to part of NATO. It's never happened, and they've been talking about that for quite a long time. So past presidents really haven't been able to get that over the line either, because in the end, NATO just didn't want to be that provocative. Exactly. And that's very bitter. And that's the result. That I can't blame. Sorry, but I can't blame NATO and the uh, European countries in the US that that's, you see, that's the result. Probably he wouldn't have attacked a NATO country, you know. War, of course, creates many disabled people and it can be life-threatening for many existing disabled people. There are stories from the Second World War of blind people who contributed to the war effort through tasks like radio monitoring, decoding, that kind of thing. Do you think there will be IT professionals, highly skilled people in the use of computers, who may be able to make some sort of contribution to the war effort in some way? Again, I hope so. I hope so because we are not very advanced in the industry of accessibility, unfortunately. As you said, Grammarly, I actually didn't know. No, oh no, I knew that it was a Ukrainian, right? It's a Ukrainian startup, like Grammarly. But that's very, that's very, very Ukrainian, so to say. Unfortunately, accessibility is not our strongest point. So it may be that there are people who are on the sidelines who really want to contribute, but can't. Yeah, just a lot, just a lack of education. People are not evil. People just don't say, "Ha, ah, that was blind, blind people. We don't want them." No, they're not like that. They just don't know what to do. Our world now revolves around IT infrastructure. What role do you think cyber warfare is going to continue to play in this conflict? Is it going to get significantly worse potentially? Yes, it's growing. The role of the cyber, cyber everything of the web and so on and so forth, that's growing, of course, because of the connection, because of the communication, online banking, actually Ukraine, uh, I still cannot pronounce that, that those words before war, before the war, Ukraine was a great country <laughs> concerning online bank, banking, online services, because now I'm in Germany. And sorry, Germans, but actually Germans do know about those things. Germany is not a very online country, so to say. Still, there are many, uh, many papers to sign, many uh, letters to receive in your snail mailbox. And um, yeah, you even here, you even receive your bank cards, your credit cards per mail, per snail mail. In Ukraine, it's just not possible. It just, just doesn't work. You go to the bank, you still receive, receive your card straight away. You change your PIN online and so on and so forth. That's it's totally, totally online. And that's why it's our strong point. It's our weak point. The strong point, because of course it's online, it's modern, it's great and it's web. And the weak point exactly is that we can, we can be attacked like a cyber attack. It's interesting the way that a number of Eastern Bloc countries have really embraced quite sophisticated technology like this. Estonia is another example. They're very advanced in terms of their e-democracy and that kind of thing. Oh, they are. Yeah, they are very, very advanced. Yes, yes. Electronic citizenship and so on and so forth. Yes, yes. You are now in Germany and uh, their response has been criticized for being a little bit tepid because of the gas pipeline issue there. They've, they've got that conflict there. Ukraine certainly has the world's attention right now, but how satisfied are you about the substance of that response? No, not satisfied. Sorry. I also have to criticize. We Yesterday we went on a demonstration with Ukrainian flags, you know, with uh, – all the things we stood and we went to to uh, to a place like to a square in the center of the city. We tried to bring attention to our issues because actually the answer is very very weak, very un- insufficient, so to say. I mean, it should be harder. It should be harsh, even. I would say. Do you want NATO to send troops in to rescue Ukraine? Would that be your objective? 
it would be great. I mean, at least now, because now the the war is already there. I mean, there's nothing to wait for. There's nothing to wait for. But what I would I would I would want uh, Russia Putin's Russia to be isolated. Like we are now petitioning for disconnecting Russia from SWIFT from you know payment system uh, banking payment system. Uh, of course, gas, no gas, no petrol, no nothing. That would be no energy from Russia. I know that there's, it's tough. We are warned here in Germany that the prices are high and they will grow even more, the energy prices. But, I mean, that's how how previous government arranged those things. I mean, why is Germany dependent on Russia so much? That's now that's the consequence. If you take him out of SWIFT, though, that is going to hurt a lot of innocent Russian people, isn't it? And I suppose one of the problems we've got is that it is so oppressive, so dictatorial. We know there are Russians who are even in this climate actually braving going out and protesting in some Russian cities when they know they could be arrested and the consequences could be extremely severe. I suspect despite all of the ridiculous, terrible misinformation that Russians have been exposed to, there is still a lot of Russians who just think what is going on is of course. outrageous. And so that's that's the danger, isn't it? That Well, I guess that's the nature of war, that innocent people get hurt. Exactly. That's dangerous, but they still won't die, right? They still won't, won't get bombed, right? I didn't say I didn't say we should uh, or we I mean NATO or Ukraine or whoever should bomb like peaceful cities. I will I will never say that. That's because that's just atrocious. We shouldn't do that. And of course I know decent Russian people and you know decent Russian people. I mean I'm that's the most complicated I mean the second complicated thing the fir- the most complicated thing is to just survive just not to go mad because of that of the war raging and the second complicated thing is not to become a hater like not to hate people per nationality that's also an atrocious thing it's also a thing that should never happen and i tell i'm telling now to myself i'm just looking to a virtual mirror and i said do not hate people per nationality it's not russian russian people are not are not culpable that they, they not them it's not them who are the culprits if we look at the way that americans might be thinking about this there are a couple of things going on i think one is that there is a lot of misinformation social discourse information dissemination has really broken down in the united states and so a lot of things are now being disseminated as facts that are just absolute errant nonsense. And the other thing mm-hmm. that has happened too is that Americans are tired. They fought that long war in Afghanistan. They fought a war based on falsehoods in Iraq. And there's a very strong sense that I detect when I listen to media and talk to people in the United States, we are done with being involved in foreign wars that don't directly affect us. What do you say to people who are feeling like that? I totally understand those people, of course. But on the other end, Putin must be stopped. It's a must. I rarely uh, actually use that verb, must. But he must be stopped. Otherwise, he will never stop because i mean okay he will imagine he will invade uh ukraine and he will i mean he already invaded uh, has already invaded ukraine he will imagine he will just swallow it but he will go further how much further poland germany czech republic whatever soviet union back empire i don't know and Sometime he can just press the button. That's my and everyone's, uh, I would say, biggest fear. If he presses the button, you know, the nuclear button. 
that will be a concern for people that taking the kind of action that Ukrainians would like could precipitate that. Yes, yes, that can be also, yes, yes. That's why I'm not very, I really, I'm not a politician. I'm not a president of Ukraine, of course. That's why I'm I'm not sure what's the best solution here. Otherwise, I would write to uh, Mr. Zelensky. I would, I would find a way to write to him if I knew the best solution, but I don't know the best solution. Is there anything as an IT professional that you think you can do from this distance that makes even a little bit of a difference? Yes. Uh, first of all, not even as an IT uh, professional, but as an internet geek, I would say. <laughs> It's a, it's yeah it's a very useful thing to post social in in the social networks and particularly to find and to uh point at fakes because again as i've said there there are many many fakes those times and you better say that this is a fake that is also a fake and that is true for example that's the thing that we can do translating of course because many and inf- many uh, informational resources are, are in ukrainian sometimes in russian but far less in english that's what i also do i know that uh, that ukrainian uh, that ukrainian forces ukraine searches for so to say white hackers you know white white hackers are those hackers who actually defeat evil hackers who, not, who do not attack, but who uh, mitigate the attacks. Those people are ser- are being searched by Ukraine now. But it looks inevitable, doesn't it, that eventually a puppet regime will be installed in Ukraine? I don't think it's inevitable. Still, I'm hoping for another solution of that conflict. Because otherwise, otherwise, an internal war, as, as, I mean, it, war inside Ukraine will continue, and and keep and keep and keep and keep on going. Because Ukrainians are very, very, um, so to say, they they are fond of their freedom, you know, most of them, still, and we won't sell our freedom. We won't we won't let anyone to. Uh, to take our freedom from us. That's, I mean, that's why it, it would be hard times. I hope that by having this conversation, you and I have perhaps made a few people think about something that they might hear on the news and they shrug their shoulders and say, that's horrible, and leave it at that because what we've sought to do by talking to you is convey the human consequences of this atrocious thing that is going on. And I have no doubt that this has been a very, very difficult conversation for you. And I just want to thank you sincerely for having it. And I hope we've just raised some awareness and uh, shared the human consequences of this. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I would like to thank everyone who supports me now and supports all of us now. I mean, it's so... It's a, it's a very, I would say, it's a great feeling when you know when a, a New Zealander or an American or, or or a Chinese person or whatever, I mean, whatever in the whoever in the world, they just write where 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 we stand with you, we support you, and that's really really, I mean, that makes me believe in 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 the mankind and the humanity, and that's that's great. Thank you so much. And of course, if, if, if anyone has any questions or any concerns, you can contact me or you can contact Jonathan, I hope, right? Jonathan, you, you would just trans- transmit the uh, messages. Yes, of course, absolutely. Me, of course. What's on your mind? Send an email with a recording of your voice or just write it down. Jonathan at mushroomfm.com. That's J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N at mushroomfm.com. Or phone our listener line. The number in the United States is 864-60-MOSIN. That's 864-60-66736.
Looking at some miscellaneous Apple things, Marissa writes in and says, Hello, Jonathan. I am not a Braille user. However, I have noticed that voiceover's ability to focus is horrible. No matter whether you're on the home screen or with apps, voiceover is very jumpy. I have emailed Apple Accessibility, and I don't think they understand how frustrating and consistent this issue is. It has been going on for as long as I can remember. Have you noticed this? Do you have any suggestions to fix it or whom I should contact within Apple Accessibility to escalate this issue? In addition, I notice that I sometimes cannot go back using a two-finger scrub. For example, when typing, let's say, a message, I will have finished and sent the message, then two-finger scrubbed to go back to the list of messages. VoiceOver will say, keyboard hidden. I'm just using the Messages application as an example. This happens in other ones as well. This issue is very inconsistent. It does not happen all the time. I thought I read somewhere that with the newer iPhones, in my case the iPhone 12 Pro Max, with the newest update, iOS 15.3.1, that the going back gesture with two-finger scrub didn't work. Thank you for any assistance you can give. Thanks, Marissa. I am not having any issues whatsoever with the two-finger scrub. There are a few instances where the two-finger scrub may not work, and it may be necessary to double-tap the back button at the top of the screen. That's often something that the app developer needs to fix. But when I used to train people in the use of the iPhone, I also noticed that the two-finger scrub is one of the hardest gestures for people to get right. And it's actually one of the hardest gestures to practice because when you go into the voiceover gestures, if you perform that gesture successfully once, you are going to stop help. So it can be quite difficult to practice it. I do suspect it could be finger trouble in this case, Marissa, and that Apple is not at fault. But if others have had issues with the two-finger scrub, and I'm not talking about issues performing the gesture, although you're welcome to comment on that if you want, but if you know that you can consistently perform the gesture, but for some reason you think the gesture doesn't work as well as it used to, let me know. But I have not personally seen or heard of this on my iPhone 12 Pro Max. So I've got the same phone as you, Marissa. It's working peachy, working peachy. And one way that you could possibly diagnose finger trouble in this case is to connect a Bluetooth keyboard to your iPhone if you have one and press the escape key where you would normally do the two finger scrub. Because when voiceover is running and you press the escape key, it does perform the two finger scrub gesture. So if it works for you there, then it is finger trouble, I'm almost certain. Now, I don't fully understand the first issue you raise about focus One thing that's handy in this situation is if you can give steps to reproduce exactly what you do, the result that you're expecting, and the result that you're getting instead. An email from Paul Hopewell who says, Hello, Jonathan, you might like to look at this app, which runs on iPhone, iPad, and Mac, and tell your podcast about it. You set it up to specify the cookie preferences which you want, which then applies to all websites. And you can therefore avoid the tedium of setting the cookie preferences which most websites in the UK and maybe New Zealand demand. Yes, I have seen this in the UK and the EU, Paul, but no, it's not something that happens here. This is GDPR related, which is a Europe thing. He continues, we usually take the easy option and agree to all cookies, which is not usually what you want. I have installed it on my iPhone and it works great. So there you go. If you are in the EU or you visit a lot of EU sites where you get these pesky cookie notices, it might be worth checking out. The app is called Super Agent for Safari and Paul is vouching for the accessibility of that. On to one of our favorite Apple subjects of the moment, Braille, and Alco is in touch, who says, Hi, Jonathan, I do not have problems with the touch freezing while reading Kindle books. However, the BI series still freezes and writing emails on the touch and the BI series can be problematic if you don't go slow. It is difficult to go down a line. Enter does not work and I have to use the panning button to continue. 
Thanks, Alka. Yes, we've received consistent reports from people having issues composing email, and it sounds like those of us with the Mantis might be best off. Certainly there are tracking issues, but actually typing away on the QWERTY keyboard seems all right. But editing email is definitely a problem area, one of several that persist with Braille input at the moment. I haven't noticed too many improvements with Beta 4 so far, which has just been released. Releases are getting more frequent now as we get closer to Apple's rumoured event in early March, which will give us new Macs and a new version of the iPhone SE. Who knows what other mysteries Apple will have in store? They have introduced a new American Siri voice in Beta 4, making a grand total of five, count them, five Siri voices. Would you like to hear what it sounds like? All right then. Wikipedia Paul McCartney. Sir James Paul McCartney is an English singer, songwriter, musician, and record and film producer who gained worldwide fame as co-lead vocalist, co-songwriter, and bassist for the Beatles. Would you like to hear more? Yes. One of the most successful composers and performers of all time, he is known for his melodic approach to bass playing, his versatile and wide tenor vocal range and his musical eclecticism, exploring styles ranging from pre-rock and roll, pop to classical and electronica. If you like that voice, then when iOS 15.3 comes out, you will be able to choose that by going into the Siri settings, making sure that you choose American as your voice, and then setting it to voice 5, and that's what it sounds like. It's Tim and Itveld from the Netherlands. Here's a small tip for tech-savvy users who need an accessible hard disk manager on Windows. So you do need a tool to partition their hard disk make images of their hard disk, clone a hard disk, wipe data, etc. For years, I've been using Paragon Hard Disk Manager. It was not really accessible. It was somewhat accessible. But with some difficulty, I could use it. But then, I think two years ago, they released a new version, which was completely inaccessible. It reads literally nothing. So I stuck with my old version for some time, but now it didn't work anymore when I needed to do disk imaging. And I was trying to find an accessible hard disk manager. I tried several options and that's really challenging. Hard disk managers are on Windows at least totally inaccessible. There's one exception that I just wanted to point listeners at, and that is LSoft's Active at disk image. Long story short, it's at least quite and I think completely accessible. And LSoft offers a complete hard disk manager, which does the same thing that the Paragon suite used to do for me, but makes it a lot easier for me than it used to be. So it's a pity that I didn't find them earlier. Well, it's good to see that there are still accessible options around. We need to watch that the accessible options are not hipsterized and then made inaccessible. But for now, if you need a hard disk manager as a blind computer user, just go to disk-image.com. That's disk-image.com. You can download trials and the pricing is really fair, so I think it's a good product. And really, it's the only option that you have as a blind person if you want to partition hard disks, make images, etc. Unless there are better options that I didn't know about. In that case, please let me know. This email says, Hi Jonathan, thank you for all the work you put into your podcast every week. A great help to the blind community around the world. Well, thank you so much. I am Arnold, born in the Netherlands. I live in the sometimes bumpy but beautiful island of Lombok in Indonesia for more than three years now. I keep in touch with my family and friends using WhatsApp. Works great, but I'm not happy with their privacy policy and their big tech arrogance. So I started looking for an alternative and came across Signal. Signal is also easily accessible, but there is one problem. 
When I've sent a message, I don't hear anything about the status of the message, sent slash delivered slash read. Do you or your listeners have experience with Signal, and have they reported this problem to Signal? How was Signal's reaction? I can't find anything about accessibility on their homepage. Is this perhaps another sign that Signal is not an alternative to WhatsApp? And he concludes by saying, I hope my English wasn't too bad. Thanks so much in advance for your response. Well, thanks so much for writing in, Arnold. It's good to hear from you, and your English is just great. No worries about that. I've not tried Signal. I've heard of it, but haven't tried it, mainly because most of the people that I want to communicate with are iPhone users, and we all just use iMessage, which is an encrypted and really robust solution. I know that Telegram is becoming more popular in the blind community, and there is an app that's under development called Tweezcake, which does Twitter and even internet radio and RSS feeds and a range of things. And they do have a Telegram module in there as well. Tweezcake is available for Mac OS as well as Windows. And of course, we've covered Voxmate before, which incorporates Telegram as well. I'm not sure about the state of Telegram and iOS, although you didn't mention whether you're using iPhone or Android, but Telegram could be another option for you to consider. However, if anybody has any comments on these third-party, lesser-known messengers, if we want to go a little bit off the beaten path away from WhatsApp and iMessage, those sorts of things, please let us know. Are you using Telegram? Are you using Signal? What's it like out there? Benji writes, Dear Jonathan, my apologies if you've already covered the topic and answered related questions. I am looking for a headset or a microphone with a 3.5 millimeter earphone socket on the mic for making telephone or VoIP calls on iOS devices. My main requirement is high quality input so that I can be heard loud and clear at the other end. Your advice is always gratefully received. With thanks and best wishes to you and the family, Benji from the UK. Thank you for writing in, Benji. You might like to go trolling through the archives because we have discussed headset options before. And it's not something that I need to worry about too much because I just have my audio piped directly into my hearing aids. But one option you do have if you want a wired headset is to buy the camera adapter kit. I think Apple might be able to sell more of these if they renamed it to something more appropriate. Because although it's called the camera adapter kit, you can do so much with this. Essentially, what you can do is plug most USB peripherals into the lightning port of your phone with this adapter. Now, you said that you wanted a 3.5 millimeter jack, but this could be another way of achieving this. So if you plug in a good quality USB headset into the camera adapter kit, that may work, although I have not tried this at home. If you want to go the Bluetooth route, if you're not too concerned about whether it's wired or not, there are plenty of Bluetooth headsets out there, some of which give quite good quality on the iPhone these days. So we'll open it up and we'll see what people are thinking these days in terms of headsets. But do check out the archives. You'll find them all at mosin.org. And of course, in recent times, the transcripts are there as well, so they can be handy. An email now from Graham Robbie, who says, Hi, Jonathan. Great to hear you back after a well-earned break. I know you like tech oddities, so I thought I'd let you know about this one just in case you or some of the other listeners know of a fix. I've been subscribed to Apple Music for several years. However, for the past two years or so, one thing has been driving me round the bend about this service, the lack of gapless playback while using an iOS device. On my iPhone 12 Pro and iPad Pro, both running iOS 15.3 and earlier, if I'm listening to an album that was made to be heard without any gaps between tracks, a good example being Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, Apple Music inserts a half second or so gap between each of the tracks. Alternatively, when listening to any album, track one ends, then you hear a half second of track two, then a half second or so gap before the track resumes. What is even more odd about this behavior on my Google Pixel 6 using the Android Apple Music app, everything works just fine. I have contacted Apple about this issue a couple of times, but so far have had no joy other than the standard response, we are aware of the problem and one day over the next century you may or may not get a fix depending on what mood we're in at the time. Gee, I would love it if Apple actually responded that way. You should frame that email. (laughs) I've been on several forums and it seems I'm not the only one experiencing this issue. 
It has gone to the point where I'm seriously looking to ditch Apple Music for another streaming service such as Amazon Music Unlimited. Yes, Graham, you're absolutely right. And dare I speak its name at the moment, but <laughs> but Spotify does not do this. The go-to test album that I use, not surprisingly, for anybody who knows me remotely, is Abbey Road by The Beatles. And of course, you've got that stunning medley there. And listening to it on Apple Music is just diabolical. It's really, really bad because you get exactly the symptoms that you describe. It is amazing that Apple Music was launched back in 2015. Here we are in 2022 and they still can't get it right. I have got Cobuzz, which is a very high fidelity music service. Perhaps their point of difference has largely disappeared now that Apple Music has got lossless. But I don't think Cobuzz has this problem either. And one of the advantages with Cobuzz is that if you subscribe to the right plan, you get a substantial discount if you want to buy the music in lossless format, which is really great for me sometimes. So Cobuzz is good. I don't know why Apple Music can't sort this out. They really should. Hi, Jonathan. This is Joy in Montana in the United States. My husband and I try to listen to your podcast most weeks, and I'm calling to give you a sunburn remedy. If you can take a cloth, a small cloth, and saturate it with heavy whipping cream and just pour that on really well and then lay it on the sunburn for about five or ten minutes. It will curdle the cream and the cream will take the pain out of the sunburn and if you can do that several times a day, then it will heal the skin and it will keep the sunburn from flaring up as bad as it otherwise might. Thank you so much, Joy. I'm pleased to say the sunburn's run its course now, but next time this happens, and I hope it won't happen too often because I've got to be very sun smart since I had a bit of a skin cancer episode a couple of years ago, I will try this. That sounds really cool. Vinegar's supposed to help too, isn't it? It's amazing how many cool remedies there are out there that really do work. And I appreciate you taking the time to send that in. Here's a salutary lesson. When you've got oodles of disk space, you don't necessarily have to delete things, even if you think that you're not going to need something again. I mean, I suppose there is a danger of being a hoarder, a digital hoarder. And I can only think that it was this haunting prospect of being an e-hoarder that caused me to delete my little The Blind Man and the Dell jingle. You remember we used it once on the podcast last year when I was having issues with the Dell XPS 15 that I then owned, that I have now sold, that I do not miss. But we could have used the jingle again because I did want to draw your attention to a very interesting TSN, a technical support notice that has been posted by Freedom Scientific. And the subject of it is, on Dell computers, Windows becomes sluggish, virtual memory errors appear, or applications unexpectedly close or crash when Waves Max audio service is running. It continues. If your Dell PC or laptop uses the Waves Max audio service for its onboard audio chipset, problems may occur the longer you use the computer. Windows may become sluggish. Applications such as JAWS or Microsoft Teams may close or crash unexpectedly. Virtual memory errors might occur. Yucky. They don't say that, I do. (laughs) But it is yuck. The answer is to disable the WavesMax audio service, and this may well improve the quality of your user experience with perhaps some sacrifices. But you can check this Freedom Scientific tech support notice for full instructions, step-by-step instructions. I just wanted to share that because I've seen this myself when I was using Adele. You may be seeing it too, and so there is a way around it Uh, hopefully until Dell fixes this issue at their end or the WavesMax people fix the issue at their end. So I will endeavor to remember to put a link to the tech support notice in the show notes, but you should also be able to search for this on the Freedom Scientific website. If you've experienced this, let me know how it's working out for you. Hi, Jonathan. This is Chris Westbrook here. I wanted to bring up a couple of issues that I've been noticing in my work. I'm an accessibility tester. You mentioned before about JAWS being a little bit too interpretive 
I guess is the word, when speaking. And, and here's an example of that. I'm going to play two sentences here and see if you can figure out what the problem is. The first sentence. Anyone caught drinking under the age of May 21st be asked to leave the premises. And the second sentence. Anyone caught drinking under the age of 21 may be asked to leave the premises. The only difference <laughs> is in the second sentence, I spelled out the word 21 instead of using the number 21. So God is interpreting 21 May as May 21st because I'm in America and I I don't know if there's a setting for U.S. dates or what, how Jaws is determining that, but it's really kind of screws up that sentence pretty well. NVDA did the same thing, believe it or not. So that's, I thought that was really interesting. First time I'd seen that happen. Anyway, the, the second issue, I was wondering what people thought about decorative images. I'm sure you've seen these websites where every image is described. You know, they'll say a man walking down the street holding a laptop or sometimes they even go so far as to say just space or board or, or, or anything like that. I tend to think that the images should only be described if they convey information that isn't conveyed in the surrounding text or um, if they're part of a link, you know, then you put where the link goes or what it does. Um, and that's our policy as a company where I work for. But I was just wondering, curious how other people thought about that, um, thought that might spark some discussion. Yes, indeed. A couple of excellent points for discussion, Chris, and good to hear from you. Let me deal with the first one first, because this one really frustrates me. But I think we should define where the problem lies, at least in this particular instance, the reason why you're seeing this on NVDA and the reason why you would also see it if you used this text-to-speech engine on your iPhone or Android device is because this is the way that vocalizer text-to-speech voices pass a string like 21 May. They will always speak it as May the 21st, and it doesn't seem to matter what your date is set to in your operating system. This seems to be a vocalizer thing. And it's actually quite hilarious where this comes up as a bit of a bothersome thing. For example... If you are a friend of Mike May on Facebook, Facebook may come up and say Mike May 21 hours ago, and it will say Mike May 21st or whatever the number is. It will interpret it as a date. It's very frustrating, and I wish that screen readers and text-to-speech engines would just give us the information and let our brain interpret what is on the screen rather than trying to be clever. As I think I've mentioned in the past, the best one I ever saw was the old Keynote Gold, which used to say phone number Aviv every time it saw Tel Aviv. But something caught my attention recently on the subject from the Financial Times. I was so impressed in some ways that the Financial Times were aware of this. They put this tweet out and they've said that from now on, whenever we refer to millions in our publication, the Financial Times, we're going to use the abbreviation MN instead of M because screen readers are interpreting the M as meters. So you might be reading the Financial Times and it might say there's a 22M project underway and many screen readers or text-to-speech engines, I'm not sure who is responsible for this particular abbreviation, might come out with there's a 22-meter project underway. So the Financial Times thought they would be proactive and address this issue by changing the abbreviation from M to MN to signify millions. And they put this out in the tweet. And I thought, wow, (laughs) on the one hand, that's pretty groovy. But on the other, somebody very quickly pointed out, this is all very well and good, but the MN is also an abbreviation in the United States for Minnesota. So now you've gone from a 22-meter project to a 22-Minnesota project. If the screen readers and the text-to-speech engines would just say a 22M project, you would get the context. Your brain would do the rest. And I really think it's getting out of hand, and I wish that we could change this. 
I'm sure we have some pretty hilarious, on the one hand, examples of this problem. And if you would like to share any of them with me, you're welcome to be in touch. My email address to which you can write something down or attach an audio clip is jonathan at mushroomfm.com. That's J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N at mushroomfm.com. Call in 864-60-MOSIN if you would like, 864-606-6736. That second one you raise about the decorative imagery is a really complicated one, isn't it? On the one hand, I do like to know what's on the screen, how things are laid out. On the other, sometimes it really does detract from the text. So I'll be intrigued to hear what you get back on that feedback, whether there's some sort of hard and fast rule that people would like to have applied on that one. Be the first to know what's coming in the next episode of Mosin at Large. Opt in to the Mosin media list and receive a brief email on what's coming so you can get your contribution in ahead of the show. You can stop receiving emails anytime. To join, send a blank email to media-subscribe at mosin.org. That's media-subscribe at M-O-S-E-N dot org. Stay in the know with Mosin at Large. Hello, Jonathan and Mosin at Large listeners. I just want to make some comments on the new Face ID with a mask feature that's in beta with iOS 15.4. And someone had asked whether or not Face ID requires attention, whether that feature is on or off. And it does work either way. I've tested it both ways. I've tested it with that feature turned on and with it turned off. And Face ID with a mask will work either way. Personally, I prefer to have that feature turned on because it's more secure. And that's just my personal preference. But rest assured, it will work either way. And I'm glad that they finally added this feature because it was fine using it with my watch. But If I don't have my watch or I want to unlock a third-party app, this will do the trick. So now when I'm out and using my banking app, for example, with a mask, I can now unlock my banking app, and that's awesome. Anyway, keep up the great work, Jonathan. I love the show. And in fact, it's because of your series on Chromebooks that I was convinced by my wife to get a Chromebook for Christmas. So... That's another piece of tech I'm playing with now, and it's thanks to you. So once again, keep up the great work, and we're really enjoying the show, and everybody stay safe. Thank you very much. That is Earl, who has been out in a boat, obviously somewhere in Canada with his face mask on, and Earl tells me in his email that he is totally blind. So thank you. That's useful info. And yes, no doubt, having attention on is more secure. I think there will be some blind people for whom that's just not an option. I don't know, but I imagine that having attention on will not work so well if you have prosthetic eyes or if you have trouble keeping your eyes open for even a brief period to get eye contact with the camera. But that is good that it is also working with attention mode off. Here's an email from Liel Ben Simon, and he says, Hi, Jonathan and all. Lately, I have started to learn contracted Braille with an uppercase B. For those that want to learn it, I have a recommendation about UEB Online. UEB Online is a website that teaches writing and reading Braille, and in addition, contracted Braille. Your computer keyboard operates as a Braille keyboard. The writing is done in 6-dot Braille instead of 8-dot. I love this website and highly recommend it. And if you want to try this for yourself, you can go to uebonline.org. And that's all one word, uebonline.org. Greetings, Jonathan Mosen and Mosen at Largers. This is Stan Warren Luttrell in Medford, Oregon. And this is probably the most... Interesting, well, not interesting, but strangest posts that I've ever provided you. About three weeks ago, I had a life-changing event. And this is so emotional, it's sort of difficult for me to talk about. Because it's really caused me to focus on my life and how it has changed forever. Three weeks ago, I was visiting one of my local 
favorite restaurants here in Medford, Oregon. And I really should have paid attention to warning signs that I will explain because I had a series of shoulder pains on the Thursday night before this event happened. And while I was at my one of my favorite restaurants, I was lucky to be in the right place at the right time. Because if I was anywhere else, you folks would never hear from me ever again. What am I talking about? I experienced a heart attack. Uh, this heart attack, and I, I had some shoulder pain, as I mentioned earlier, on the Thursday night before th this happened, about three weeks ago, this Saturday. And fortunately, there was someone there, a friend, who knew CPR. And as a result of this heart attack, I died three times. And the ambulances were, came there and I was in the hospital for four days. I was released on the phone, I was there Saturday. After, oh, the heart attack commenced at about 8.05 on that Saturday morning. And uh, it took the ambulance about eight minutes to get there. And I know I scared a couple of friends um, a great deal. And I was fortunate because if I was anywhere else or if I was at home since I lived by myself I would not be here and one of the things that I had done previously and this may sound morbid to talk about but I had some planning with a local funeral system and I left word of what people to call just in case something like this happened. And fortunately, the proprietor of the restaurant knew some of the people that were involved and could get in touch with people. She got in touch with a couple of people and I, one of those, uh, uh, through another person, was able to get in touch with my sister's who live in an area further north than I am. And it was a scary, scary experience. And if talking about this can save someone else from doing this, I mean, none of us are going to make it out of here alive. We could argue over what happens after and we can discuss that and we can do whatever. But the point is, none of us are going to live forever. And I really wanted to send this notification because I never envisioned that this could happen to me. But I'm fortunate. I managed to be around people that were knowledgeable and knew how to deal with that situation and I don't know I I really am overjoyed that I get a chance to continue because 
I really wasn't ready to leave. I mean, I know none of us have a choice in that, but if we can make changes in our lifestyle and do certain other things, maybe we can make a difference. And I'm hoping that this post will give people something to think about in these turbulent and tumultuous times. And Jonathan, I I appreciate what you do with this podcast. And I'm immensely happy that I can continue to listen to more of them. And I've been contemplating sending you an email with this audio attachment for a while. But I've been just trying to formulate my thoughts and how I was going to say this. Because I really uh, didn't realize, you know. And oh, by the way, I will tell you, uh, uh, as a result of all the, the CPR, I've endured a great deal of pain for the last several weeks. And... Uh, thank you to some of the meds I'm able to formulate this message because for a while, ooh, it was a lot of pain. I'm still going through a lot, but at least with things like ibuprofen, at least it's able to calm things down to where it's kind of feels like it's healing a little bit. And I... I hope that this is something that will be of use to some of you. And again, thank you for what you do. And I will take leave for now. Yes, only for now, Stan. Definitely only for now. Thank you so much for getting in touch and sharing that. And obviously, it is wonderful that you are here to share that with us. I've not had an experience like that, but I think many of us can relate to that feeling of a love of life and a sense of what's real, what's important, what's trivial when somebody close to us dies. And sometimes we go through these major life-changing events like that. You have a dear friend or a family member, something like that, and they die And suddenly everything's just in this vivid perspective. Everything seems to be proportionate. And you realize how fortunate you are to have the time that you have on the planet. So I can't relate completely to what you've been through. But I do understand that renewed sense of love of life that you get from those crisis sorts of situations. So it's obviously very fortunate that you were in the right place at the right time. And I wish you all the very best with your continued recovery. Mosin at Large Podcast. To South Africa we go for this email, and it is from Brandt Steenkamp. He says, hello, Jonathan. I trust you are well. I hope you are too, Brandt. Good to hear from you. I am a firm believer in the utility of Braille with an uppercase B and use it as far as I can. However... I am also a pragmatist and do not insist on everything in my life being brailled. To get back to using Braille wherever I can, over the years I have used Braille on Windows, Mac OS, phones, both iOS and Android, as well as Linux, both desktop and console. I have come to the conclusion that for a pure Braille user, the best place to be is the Linux console. Uh, No, I'm not talking terminal. I am talking no GUI, graphical user interface at all. After all, we as a community have been productive computer users long before graphical icons became the in thing. My current system is a Huawei MateBook D15, 16 gigabytes of RAM and 512 gigabytes of solid state storage running Slint Linux, a derivative of Slackware and Salix on the bare console. I can do most everything I have to do. Email using Alpine, 
listening to you blather on every week, which I really enjoy, by the way. Twitter with the Rainbow Stream, you get the idea. Unfortunately, sometimes a GUI is needed. Most HTML5 web browsers do not like links or any of the other text-based browsers. If I could, I'd ditch the GUI entirely. But if wishes were horses, poor men would ride and all that. Why the console? The answer is simple, for me at least. One, I can get along without something yapping in my ears. I get bad headaches from synthesized speech, thus Braille is my only option. Two, the console is completely keyboard-driven. You won't find anything that will run on the console that requires a mouse. In all other OS setups, for computers anyway, I've used over the years, there sometimes will be software you need to use that needs some kind of special input from you, the user, or modifications made to your screen reader to make the software usable. I don't have to do that with BRL TTY on my console, or more likely three or four open consoles. I understand not all software all people need is available for a TUI, text-based user interface, and I'm not suggesting anyone, let alone everyone, should move to the console. I just felt like this is an option people should know about. It has really improved my life plenty, and also that of my wife. Now the headaches are gone, I'm no longer a miserable so-and-so to deal with. Well, good on you, Brunt. I'm glad that works for you. It would definitely not work for me. But it's wonderful that we've got all these options at our disposal and that we can find one that meets our particular use case. Here's an email from Robert Kinjit who says, Given the talk of Web3, NFTs and otherwise, I'd like to turn your attention to the small web The Small Web is an initiative to build communities around sharing servers, infrastructure and experiences, including art. The Fediverse is the most prominent of this kind of network. It is decentralized but interoperable. Much like email, one can follow and interact with others on completely different platforms. The tech behind this is called Activity Pub, but there is no one centralized server as there is, say, with Twitter. In the Fediverse, you pick a community to join, not a platform. There is a very popular community for the blind, run by blind moderators, called the Dragon's Cave. These are free communities. There is more described images over here, in my experience, than Twitter because people adopt the social model of disability. There is even a whole directory of people that describe their images. Sure, you may come across someone from a different instance that does not describe media, but they edit and repost with accessible images most of the time when asked most of the time. It is decentralized, but isn't security flawed. What's even better is that third-party apps for Mastodon and even others are highly encouraged. There's eight accessible mobile apps and even more accessible web interfaces. I'm on a different instance called Write Out. There's an instance for podcasters as well. Thanks, Robert. And I chuckled while reading that message because I'm thinking what comes around goes around, man. I go back to the 1980s. I got my first modem in 1986. And what we used to do then was we would call up bulletin boards. I even ran many bulletin boards. And I don't know whether there's any appetite out there for people to reminisce about this stuff. But I like to reminisce about the old bulletin board software because I ran so many different types of software because I was a tinkerer and a tweaker. It used to drive some of my users mad because they would wake up and suddenly the whole interface had changed because I'd gone from Wildcat to RBBS or RBBS to PC Board or to GT Powercom and all sorts of stuff like that. And we all used to communicate via FidoNet Echoes. And we'd spend lots of money on BBS door games. And oh, what fun. Anybody else remember the bulletin board days? That would be such a fun topic to talk about. So anyway, all this stuff about decentralized community and stuff, it's not new. And I'm not deriding it. I'm just saying it's not new. Things come around, you know, if you wait long enough, the fashions come back into vogue again. The thing that you are not going to get, though, with these decentralized things is critical mass. And what I like about being on Twitter is the critical mass. 
Sure, I can engage with blind people. I can engage with Mosin at large listeners. I can discuss issues of concern to me as a blind person. But equally, using the same service, I can follow politicians. I can follow journalists. I can engage with those people, engage with journalists and people that I might not otherwise have the chance to engage with. That's the downside of the whole decentralized thing where you get into these little unique communities. Sure, they have their place. I think you could argue that Reddit serves that need already and that Reddit has got critical mass. So it's good that there's that choice. It's not a bandwagon I feel really compelled to jump on. And I think it really will have trouble reaching that critical mass factor. But oh gosh, the memories of those bulletin boards. I'm trying to think of some of the other software that I used to play with back then in the bulletin board days. Of course, there was Opus. There was Fido. There was all of those little offline readers. So because you would dial in to someone's bulletin board, the object was to try and stay connected for as short a time as possible. So you had these apps like Silver Express and Blue Wave where you'd log in, they would bundle up your mail and download it for you, and you would then read them on this offline reader thing and reply, and then you'd log in and upload all your replies in one go. Oh, my word. Such fun times. Searchlight. That was another bulletin board software package I played with. Searchlight. I'm sure if I sat here long enough, I could think of all sorts of bulletin board software. And I'm sure the number of people who recall these things is infinitesimal because we're talking a long, long time ago. But they were fun days. And all these decentralized communities really do remind me of that. It's kind of cute the way these things come back. I mean, who knows? Maybe the Braille light will come back. And I say this because I have email from David Goldfield. And he says, Jonathan, I have many fond memories of calling bulletin board systems as well as being a sysop of one of them. Oh, yes. (laughs) Page the sysop. It stands for system operator for those people who weren't there. He says, I first heard about bulletin boards or BBSs in the mid-1980s. But at the time, I didn't have an accessible computer to call them. That changed a few years later when I acquired a VersaBraille P2C from Telesensory. In 1988, I went to my local radio shack and purchased a 300-board modem. That modem didn't even recognize the Hayes command set where you could issue commands with an AT prefix. That's right, me parenthetically inserting myself again. If you wanted to dial a number using DTMF, you would put ATDT followed by the number. But then if you were using DOS programs like Procom and Telex and Boyan and GT Powercom, Terminator was another one. Oh man, there were a few. And you'd download files with Z modem and X modem and all these different protocols. But anyway, that would automate the Hayes commands for you. David goes on, Instead, I had to pick up my phone, call the number, enable the modem's connection, and then hang up the phone. At that time, I had a good friend who gave me a few phone numbers for some local BBSs. Because my friend was a Commodore 64 user, these boards were primarily geared for Commodore users. However, I was fascinated by the different message boards, and I soon branched out to other types of BBSs. I eventually discovered FidoNet and accessed many FidoNet groups which were referred to as Echoes, including Blink Talk, moderated by Willie Wilson. Man, I'm going to stop here again. <laughs> Willie Wilson was a legend, and I remember he had his Blink Link bulletin board. I remember paying far too much money calling it because In those days, the only way you could call a bulletin board in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, was to phone the number. And even after hours, cheapest time was 10 p.m. till 6 a.m., I think. And calling the United States was $1.88 a minute, which is certainly a lot of money now. It was a lot more money then. And so you'd go on there and you'd grab what you could. You'd kind of do an international smash and grab raid from the bulletin board and download your things and then get off there. But Willie put a lot of time and effort and money into his Blink Talk Echo and Blink Link bulletin board. And I remember when he upgraded to his 9600 board modem in due time and he talked about striding along at 9600 board. <laughs> Yeah, David goes on. 
I'm having so much fun with this. He goes on, in 1989, I purchased the Braylon Speak from Blazy Engineering and called into Blazy Engineering's BBS, which was called the Braylon Speak Out. In 1991, I began working for Blazy Engineering and a year later became sysop of their BBS. I believe the software they were using was Opus, and Willie Wilson, who was quite an Opus expert, taught me what I needed to know in order to run the BBS. A few years later, the BBS was taken down to be replaced by a newer Telnet board. I'm not sure how popular that newer BBS became, and taking down the Opus BBS was a very sad day for me. As the internet became more dominant in my life, bulletin board systems received less and less of my attention, but I am extremely grateful for the experiences which I gained from BBSs. Many of them had quite a local feel, and some of that seems to have gotten lost with the internet's global audience. I never experienced the big online services such as CompuServe and Prodigy, but I spent many hours enjoying bulletin boards. Wow, great stuff, David. Yeah, I got on CompuServe, and I also got on Genie a little bit. To do that, initially anyway, we had to use a service called PackNet, which was a packet switching network. And oh my word, they charged a bomb. So you would pay your hourly CompuServe access, and then you would pay for this packet switching thing. So it really was expensive. But the first time I got on CompuServe and discovered the executive news service and was able to read articles from the newspaper electronically for the first time. Wow. I mean, I just went completely nuts with CompuServe and got a massive bill when I was a student and couldn't really afford such a massive bill. But what an experience that was just reading that material for the first time. And as a teen, I did, of course, discover the HSX forum on CompuServe. And if you're not familiar with that, well, that's all right. You're probably better off not being familiar with it. And you know you are a true geek if you can remember your CompuServe user ID because it was a long string of numbers with a comma in the middle. Oh, man great days. And if you want to share some bulletin board memories, by all means, be in touch. The first bulletin board I ever ran was on my parents' phone line. I thought it would be a smart idea to run it between 9.30 p.m. and about 7 a.m. because no one was using the phone then anyway. The trouble is we then got calls from modems all day long from people who didn't read the bulletin board lists in which the details were published, which clearly said that the bulletin board was only on from 9.30 p.m. till 7 a.m. But the good thing is I did get another phone line out of it and ran the out-of-sight BBS on its own dedicated line. It's time once again for another exciting installment of the Bonnie Bulletin with the exciting Bonnie Mosin. Hi, guys. I have to make sure that I say your name clearly, otherwise the transcriber doesn't know what to call you. Speaker number two. That's right. That's where we resort to if we, uh, and that's squeaker number one. <laughs> so squeaker number one is eclipse, the dog to eclipse all dogs. Playing with a toy. Yeah. It's been a while since we've had you on the show and yeah. a lot has gone down since then. A lot then. has gone down since then. Now, when we were kids, we used to listen both at opposite sides of the world to Radio Moscow. Mm -hmm. When the whole Ukrainian thing started to fire up, I thought, well, what's the Radio Moscow equivalent these days? And there used to be this thing called the Voice of Russia, which was remotely what you would expect from something like that. Which but actually had Russians on it. Now they have this thing called Radio Sputnik, and I have no idea what that's about. Every time I've turned it on, it's been Americans. I have yet to see anyone from Russia on there. The programming is uh, strange. At bet. I, I don't even understand it, honestly. I looked it up and it, it says it's out of Russia with regional correspondents around the world and I think Buenos Aires, Washington, D.C., London, I think. But there's I don't understand it. You know, I, I'm not sure what it is. And honestly, I haven't listened long enough to figure it out. It's sad that we're back there again, though, isn't it, with this Cold War number two, effectively? Yeah. And I was just talking to a friend of mine, which is really interesting. Um, I was talking to my friend Jennifer, who is younger than we are, who does not remember the collapse of the Soviet Union and never studied it in school. You know, her reality is 
Afghanistan and school shootings, because I was talking about how at least I, and maybe you to some extent, grew up with the Soviet threat, is if you want to call it that, the Soviet threat, that we had to have bomb drills where we hide under our desk, which I'm really sure would keep you safe from a nuclear missile. But, you know, that's what we did. And There's that amazing line from the Leningrad song by Billy Joel that says Cold War kids were hard to kill under their desk in an air raid mm-hmm. drill. And we never heard that here, but we obviously feared nuclear war. And, uh, you know, listening to Radio Moscow, it almost felt naughty listening to Radio it did. Moscow. You felt like you were. Shortwave. Yeah. And I corresponded with, I was on one of their programs in the 80s called uh, Listener's Request Club, which was run by a Soviet journalist named Vasily Strelnikov, who was the son of Boris Strelnikov, who was a, a TASS correspondent in the US, New York for many years. So I got to be on the show, which was kind of cool when I was 17. And, um, just in writing, though, right? Or just, did they... No, I actually was on the show. I actually was uh, – my voice was on the show. Wow. Yeah. So um, – wonder if we could get a recording of that. Oh, gosh, probably not. I think I had a recording for a while because it was their pen pal thing where you could get pen pals. I got so many pen pals. It was kind of embarrassing. And I got marriage proposals, you know. Uh, it was it was, it was was pretty crazy. But later, I – was friendly with a Russian translator who worked for the mission, the UN mission, when I was living in Morristown, got to know him. About the same age, a little older than me. And it was it was interesting that a lot of the things that we did or went through as children, they did too. You know, they had the air raid drills as well because they were afraid the Americans were going to attack them. So it was interesting putting that kind of human perspective in it. Yes. And I started using the term Cold War II to describe what's going on now. And I think that's quite accurate. Although there's more about this war than is cold, as anybody in Ukraine will tell you, of course. So I don't want to minimize what those innocent people are going through. But I do wonder what impact cyber warfare potentially, and just the greater connectedness of the world is going to have. The Iron Curtain is not going to be so mysterious as it was when we were kids. No, no, because you can, you know, get on the live stream and see what's going on. And being in the church that we were in, we've we've had a lot of connection with Russia and particularly the Ukraine over the years with missionaries and people coming from the Ukraine and, and different things like that. A lot of missionaries going over there. The One of our preachers in the 80s, he and his wife had actually moved to the Ukraine in the late 90s. And the last I had heard, they were in Kazakhstan teaching at a international boarding school. But they've since gone back to the Ukraine. And the power of the internet, I just started Googling around his name and church, Ukraine, and found out that he was back at uh, Vinogradar, probably pronouncing that wrong, church in Kiev, and there was a podcast. So I subscribed to the podcast and found out that they had evacuated to Albania a few days ago because of the, the Russian threat. And then my sister, they trained a preacher in the Ukraine who's Ukrainian, and he has been keeping them updated on what's going on there. So there's definitely, like you said, a more connection. As someone who's kind of really studied Russian history and um, always been very fascinated with with Eastern Europe, which is very complicated uh, historically and uh, geopolitically, was the Cold War ever really over? I don't think it was. I think it just changed. I think it was until Putin started asserting his fantasies. I mean, let's not forget the amazing sense of entrepreneurialism and free market ideology that pervaded Russia for a while. Yes, but there's also another element that is the um, family-in-law, what they call the family-in-law, which is the corruption that's the organized crime. The oligarchs. The oligarchs. Yes. Um, who on on some levels are even more, in my mind, scarier than Brezhnev and Khrushchev. The Soviets were bad, obviously bad, did a lot of damage, a lot of bad things. But I don't think that they would have ever pushed that button. I think that they had that fear 
of the U.S. that knowing that if they pushed it, we had another one we could push well, too. Yeah. It's the whole doctrine of mutually assured destruction. Exa- right? Exactly. Yeah. And I don't think we have that anymore because a lot of those nukes went missing and um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and – we did have the rise of the organized crime, which was always there. But a lot of the, the old KGB officers and whatnot went into this, and they're very intelligent people. You know, they're evil people, but they're very intelligent people with their cyber crimes and what I've been told by Russians and the Russian mafia is, is pretty scary. Well, I really hope we hold the line on this as a Western alliance because we've seen what has happened when we've tried appeasement. It annoys me that so often we fail to learn the lessons of history. Mm -hmm. We know appeasement doesn't work. The Western alliance have been appeasing Putin for years, and this was inevitable. I saw something earlier that said that this would be a great time for Russian generals to do a coup. Absolutely it would. And it could yeah. be. You yeah. never know. Let's hope so. You don't know what's going on behind the Let's hope curtain. so. Last time you were on, we talked about the epic guide dog refusals. Well, not so much a refusal, the shunning, the yes. the ostracizing of a guide mm-hmm. dog. And Kelly Mugridge wrote in about this, but I haven't had you on the show since then. So sorry for the delay, Kelly. Uh, she's in the UK mm. and she says, hi, Jonathan and Bonnie. Sorry. Hi, Kelly. Yeah. Hi, Kelly. Sorry to hear about your bad experience while staying at a hotel. I have stayed at two mainstream hotels in Exeter, Devon, England, and can honestly say both these experiences have been very positive. That's good. A friend and I, who are both long cane users, felt welcomed when we stayed at two mainstream hotels. One burnt down. What? I hope you weren't responsible, oh Kelly. <laughs> one burnt down because of a fire, and one... We have been going to since 2016. I hope that the next hotel you stay at will treat you better and hope it will be positive. Most are. Most Most are. are. Yes. It's it's just when you have those experiences that are very off, but you're not expecting them because a lot of times they happen. It's like, what? You know, you you just weren't, particularly because we've not had a problem before. Out of the blue. Now, one thing I am starting to have issues with in Wellington is out of control dogs. Yeah. Um, so I am going to mention to you our guide dog school if we can do some educating because it, there's a lot of uh, rough sleepers, as they call them here, homeless, who have pets. And a lot of them are pretty aggressive. And for the second time near the countdown on Lambton Key today, I was a, a, dark, a dog charged at me. Yeah. It's so, terrible. Yeah. Before I go, says Kelly, I have a proposition to make. Mm-hmm. The proposition is this. Way back on episode eight of Mosin at Large. Whoa, that's a long that's time a long ago. long time ago. The subject was about food. What we like, what we hurt, what brings us back to our childhood and so on. I love listening to all music except classical. Oh, what? <laughs> I am proposing that we talk about our favorite songs. What songs do you remember? Your mum or your granny singing to you? What is your favorite song and why? And what song do you hate and why? <laughs> right, well, we'll just get that out of, out of the way. That's Baker Street. Hideous song. Hideous, hideous song, Baker Street. It's almost as bad as soup, and I can't be more condemning than that. Kelly continues. I am going to make a start right then. My favorite song is Heart of Gold by Neil Young. Hope you weren't trying to listen to it on Spotify, Kelly. (laughs) Well, it's back there now with very little fanfare. He just quietly put his stuff back on. I heard Boney M's cover version of it. I can't imagine Boney M singing Heart of Gold and thought it dreadful. Mm. The song I remember my mother singing to me was How Much Is That Dog in the Window? (laughs) The song I hate more than anything is I Shot the Sheriff <laughs> by Eric Clapton. Of course, Bob Marley had a crack at it, too. I can't remember. Did, did Bob Marley do it first? I don't uh, remember. Any, anyway, she says, I just detest it like detesting liver. Ugh. So my question to the listeners is, what is your favorite song? What song do you remember your mum singing to you? And what song do you hate? So Baker Street, definitely worst song in history. By Jerry Rafferty. And uh, anything by the Beatles I can dig. And the Abbey Road medley would probably be my favorite thing ever written. 
and uh, songs my mother sang to me. She used to sing this song, and I've never heard anyone else sing it. And I should Google it. It was something about, I'll buy you a little tin car to take you places when you go to town. Ooh. If you'll marry, 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 if you'll marry me. Don't I know if anyone know knows that, that one. one. Yeah. Okay, over to you, Boney. Favorite song. That's that's tough. I, I don't know that I really have a favorite song. There's things that I like, you know, a lot of 70s and 80s stuff because it does – remind me of my childhood there's there's one particular song that i always said that if i were in my casket and they played it i'd probably get up and dance and that's so excited by the pointer sisters that's a good love song love that song that's a great song i love that song as far as songs i hate <laughs> i shouldn't even say this baker street no i actually oh. like baker oh, street oh get out of sorry. here sorry unchained melody i've never it's just i hate that song <laughs> but what's funny about unchained melody is when i left my last job my boss gave me a jewelry box uh, that, i remember yes, that <laughs> and he plays unchained melody i was like oh my god this is karma I mean, it's not bad, but it's just not one of my favorites. Um, yeah, there's some songs that just get on my nerves, and that's that's one of them. I could probably do a whole show on songs that this I. This is not Baker Street. Um, songs my mom sang, Patty Cake, you know. Oh, well, Baker's Man. Baker's Man. Yeah. Um, Market with B. Market with B. Put mm. in the oven for Bonnie. Yeah, and then. There was one we used to do about this little piggy went to market. Oh, yes. Which I thought he was going to the shopping center. That's not where piggy was going. No. Um, terrible things you teach children. Somebody told me that it was about uh, a little piggy that drank way too much cider. You know, what what you in America called hard cider. What? And that's why he, he was going wee, 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 wee all, all the way, the way home. home. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, and there was one, and I remember you'd sit on someone's lap and they'd go trot a little horsey, trot to town, trot to the bridge, and the bridge fell down, and then they'd drop you. Or, Yeah, I don't remember. I'm trying to think what else my mom might have sang. Right. Uh, Mime a little teacup that, or teapot. Teapot, yeah, yeah. that was the big one. That's I'm a nice teapot. one, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. favorite food? No, no, we're not doing oh, that one again because we did it in episode eight. Oh, we did in episode eight. Yeah, okay, yeah. Cool. so we'll have to go back to episode eight to find out whether you had input into that. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, but it'd be watermelon. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> now, <laughs> before we go, we would like to invite people to a special celebration on Mushroom FM, and it's happening on the 4th of March, and Bonnie will explain it to you now. We actually met again on the fourth. We met again <laughs> on the fourth of March, more fourth of March, two thousand twelve. We had met originally in two thousand six when I was working for Seeing Eye and exhibiting at a conference, the Mid Atlantic ACB Regional Conference, to be exact. And you were sitting at a table next to me, and I came over and introduced myself, and that was it. You know, if someone had told me, oh, you're sitting next to your future husband, I would have been like, I don't think so. Six years, well, four years later, five years later. Six years later. Six years later. <laughs> um, well, no, because it, I started listening. To oh, oh, I'm sorry. I yeah. shouldn't have interrupted you. So I started listening to Mushroom FM and, and corresponding with Jonathan, just like the Russians. And um, so <laughs> when he was coming to Boston, where I was living for work, for freedom, scientific, he invited me to to take part in a show. So I co-hosted the show and the rest is history. Not many people have such accurate records of their first ever major meeting. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, more than just a hello, which I do vaguely remember, I think. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I certainly remember the show. And it actually went out at 2 p.m. live on the 4th of March, which was a Sunday in 2012. And on the 4th of March, this coming Friday, the Mosin Explosion is on at 2 a.m. and then repeated at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So actually, we will be on exactly 10 years yeah, cool. to the to moment. The and so what we thought we'd do is do the Mosin Explosion together. I'm going to play some of the playlist from mm -hmm. that same show and we'll talk about it. It's funny. We like to tell people that we started a long conversation, which kept going after the show finished, yeah. and it's still going. Yeah. 
Yeah. But it was funny how many people said afterwards, wow, you two really sounded like you hit it off. And yeah, so people could see it in the stars or something. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Tremendous. So if you would like to be a part of that celebration, please do join us on Mushroom FM, where you will hear a few of these songs that Kelly's been talking about. Yeah. Might even play Harder Gold for you one day, Kelly, if yeah. you tune into the most. And I liked explosion. that show. I mean, I liked that song too. Yes, yeah, it's, a, it's a, a nice I don't think I quite understood it, but I did like it. I don't understand anything, Neil Young sings. I mean, I don't understand after the gold rush either. He sounds like he's really tripping on that song. Yeah. But anyway, that's all right. I mean, do join us on Mushroom FM the 4th of March for our 10th anniversary celebration show, well, the the anniversary of our meeting anyway. And uh, that'll be fun. We're looking forward to people's company. I believe it's been 10 years, man. Yeah, I know. It doesn't seem like 10 years. No. Yeah, and you're still as talkative as ever. I know. Yes. But we're going to go now. So thank you. Goodbye. I love to hear from you. So if you have any comments you want to contribute to the show, drop me an email written down or with an audio attachment to Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N at mushroomfm.com. If you'd rather call in, use the listener line number in the United States, 864-606-6736. Posing at large,